Hi, I'm Terry Liskevich. I'm the head volleyball coach at Oregon State University. I'm also the co-founder of Art of Coaching Volleyball that will morph into Art of Coaching later this year. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our panel for the session entitled Train All Coaches. First, Janet Carter. Janet is the executive director of Coaching Corps, and Coaching Corps trains college students and community members to serve as youth coaches. Next, Chris Marinock. Chris is the senior vice president uh, in charge of league economics and strategy of Major League Baseball. He also leads the new initiative of MLB to get more youth sport involved in baseball. Yep. Next, Anthony Robles. NCAA national champion, <coughs> Hall of Fame inductee, and also a member of the President's Council on Fitness, Nutrition, and Sport. Next, Deborah Slaner Larkin. Deborah is the CEO of the Women's Sports Foundation, former executive director of USTA, and former member of the President's Commission, Council on Sports and Physical Fitness. I'm sorry, I'm not the director of the USTA. Chris. USTA serves. serves. Corrected, Deborah. Thank you. That's, that's a, a lot of six-figure differences. <laughs> <laughs> and last is Sam Snow. Sam is the director of coaching of U.S. Youth Soccer Association, and he manages 55 different state associations and their coaching initiatives and coach training. As the project playbook states, Coaches are the delivery mechanism for quality sports programming. And our session here today, we'd like to build on the ideas that Project Play has or come up with three major ideas that we can implement to really get coaches trained. And why we should get coaches trained is really our first question. Why should we train coaches and by training them, we're going to get kids involved in youth sport. And what will training coaches do? So Janet, if you could just start out. OK, well, thank you, Terry. Uh, I want to focus on the word all in our train all coaches. We know that the kids who aren't playing are kids in low-income communities. And in part, that's because they don't have the, and we don't have the infrastructure in our low-income communities that support sports for all in other income communities. So when you think about why, who coaches in, in middle and upper income communities, it's the parents, right? So if I want to ask you to do something for me. Close your eyes and think about a coach. You're probably envisioning a coach who maybe every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon leaves work a little early, gets his golf cap on and, and gets the whistle and, and gets in his SUV and goes and, and picks up half the team and takes them to a well-maintained field. Well, I want us to work together. This is my idea. I want us to work together to change that answer to that question. And instead, I want us to be sitting in this room in a few years and envisioning as much of him as of Wendy, the coach who is coaching in monolingual Spanish-speaking mother who is coaching in a low-income community because she has the support and the infrastructure around her to help that happen. A huge part of that is training. The training has to be in her language. The training has to be at hours when she can take it. Um, she, she, we have a, a coaching core, we have mothers coaching because we are using existing infrastructures in schools to get them to be um, able to coach, like the school wellness uh, councils that are now mandated through law to um, focus on physical activity in schools. Perfect way to uh, infrastructure to get mothers to coach. The good news about parents in any, uh, in any community is they want to coach. It's not true that low-income parents don't want to coach. They will coach given the right, the, the right supports. And the great news is that kids, they want their parents there, unlike a lot of activities where they're like, please stay away. They want their, their parents to coach. So uh, that's my big idea, that we should, we should focus on how to get mothers and, and fathers in low-income communities the support so that we have volunteer coaches in every community so that every kid plays. And Chris? 
Yeah, so as you mentioned in the opening, uh, Major League Baseball is recommitting to amateur baseball and youth baseball as a means to get people excited about the game. That's one of the major initiatives of our, of our new commissioner, Rob Manfred. As part of that effort, we've done a lot of research on what makes kids want to play baseball. And the number one thing that we've identified is that good coaching makes kids want to play the game. You can get through issues with field quality or equipment issues and other things like that, but the number one determinant of the experience for a kid is, is having a good coach and a coach that has a good, fun, enjoyable experience when, when you're on the field. And so um, you know, that's the most important thing for us in terms of finding ways to encourage kids to continue to play baseball. And I think the reason why that's more important today than it was even 10 or 15 years ago comes down to the internet and it comes down to you know, your mobile phone and your ability to communicate and interact with friends over your phone, Facebook, et cetera. Because maybe 10 or 15 years ago, if you had a bad coach, you might still go play the sport because you're going and hanging out with your buddies and your friends. And so it's something that kids enjoyed to do anyway. Even if the coach wasn't great or they weren't having a great experience with the sport, they would still go. Now, if I can stay home and, and interact with my friends and have a social engagement for free with, without a lot of effort and energy, and my alternative is to put a lot of effort in and go play a sport where I have a poor coach or a coach that's not engaging and making me have a good experience, I'm going to opt out of that experience and I'm going to choose to do something different with my time. And I think that's one of the things that, that we've seen in our research is why coaching is so important. And Anthony, based on your individual sport background, why do you feel you should train coaches for, let's say, wrestling? I think it's extremely important to have a, a coach who's experienced and who has training because uh, the way I see it, at least through my experience, is that a coach is just an extension of a parent. You know, a coach is someone who help, really helps you figure out what you're, what you're made of, what you're capable of, and helps you just learn that self-esteem and self-confidence in yourself. And so I think I read the statistic that out of the 6.5 million youth coaches, less than one, point, one out of five are experienced with motivation, motivational techniques, you know, how to really motivate the youth and, and to uh, trying the hardest to feel good about themselves and things like that. And that's what brings kids back. They want to have fun. They want to feel good about themselves and what they're doing. And that's what's going to keep them active. So it's extremely important to have those coaches who know how to reach those kids. So Anthony, what you're really also hitting on is it's not only the skill teaching, but it's everything else, the how to motivate somebody, how to make it a safe environment, how to really keep them activated and, and having fun. But it's a combo. Absolutely, it definitely is a combo because especially at the, the younger kids, I mean, it's not like they're going to be pros tomorrow. Right now, we just want to have them active, have them feeling good about themselves and keep them healthy and to learn the, the fundamentals of it. And, I mean, if they want to go pro later on, that's great. But right now, it's just about just giving them those building blocks to start with. Terrific. Deborah? I agree with everything every, everyone said here. I would just add to the well-roundedness piece of that is that we really want to talk about nutrition too in order while we're teaching the physical li uh, literacy that we also need to talk about health nutrition the value of sleeping well because we want the the um, the player to be healthy and that and that's part of um, all of that by eating correctly and teaching good habits and having the right kind of snacks but I think the for me the real benefit of having uh, coaches trained is that it teaches the coaches respect for the sport. And if you have respect for the sport and respect for yourself, you're going to have respect for the child who is playing the sport. And that's really important. Be and when you do that, you're going to feel better about yourself. You're going to feel more enthusiastic about teaching the right skills and the whole holistic behavior of what we really want all coaches to be. And I, I, I've heard some today is, gee, we're asking so much of our volunteer coaches, but I think we've got to reach for the stars. It's really easy to get to the lamppost. That, that's easy. All of us in this room multitask. All of us care deeply about what we're doing. So do the mothers, the fathers, and all the other coaches. And I think we owe it to them to ask more and, and not to come into a situation unprepared. Because as Janet, you were saying, coaches coach because they want to. They want to spend more time with either their own kids or their kids' friends. So let's arm them with the tools to be trained. Terrific. Sam? Training coaches, that's what you do. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, part of the answer for me is that why train all coaches? The kids deserve it. 
uh, our parents should have an expectation of coaches just as they do of teachers and teacher aides at schools that there's some certification of those people. There's some qualification to be involved with young people. And uh, we talk to our coaches all the time that coaching is just teaching in short pants. And uh, we, we want our coaches to be trained, and they are trained. We, had, we do have an education system in uh, youth soccer in the United States for coaches to be able to go through a formalized uh, coaching progression that they can go through. So anecdotally, one of the things that we know uh, is that when our coaches go through some of that training, they stay in the sport a little bit longer, coaching in the sport a little bit longer. As a consequence, their players stay in the sport a, a little bit longer because they're getting a, a little bit better coaching. And that could even be with the, the volunteer coach who's never played the game before but suddenly finds himself or herself uh, coaching. And in line with that, we're USU Soccer, we're advocating a mandate from our national governing body. We'll see whether or not it comes to pass, but uh, that every single youth soccer coach in the country have uh, our entry level uh, course, which is the F license course, which is an online course uh, aimed at coaching under six and under eight players. So with that common denominator of every coach going through that, we hope it'll progress into them continuing up the, the education pathway. Terrific. We'll ask the second question and then we'll open it up. The second question is, what are the best opportunities for stakeholders in the space of training coaches? Does anybody want to just take that first? Well, I'll, Janet, you'll I'll go? say, right. I, I, I think that Project Play, the beauty of Project Play is in front of us. With this report, we have so many ideas. And on page 11 of the program we have, we also have the five things that have been sort of lifted out as what needs to happen. And I think we each need to find ourselves in there and ask ourselves the question, what do I bring to the table and what do I need to get this done? And then partner with somebody who can get this done. I mean, we already have people for low-income kids um, that have been doing this work a long time here. And the beauty of Project Play is they brought all the right people together, Kaboom and U.S. Soccer Foundation, Boys and Girls Club, and up to us. There's so many people that have been focused on low-income kids. We just need to collaborate more and, and do it intentionally. Yeah, I think the thing that we've seen is tr trying to find a way to get scale, mm -hmm. national scale, or even global scale if you can get there, but trying to find ways to do things in the local community at the local level, but do that across the country. Co edu education and coaching is such an individual topic. Um, you know, for those of you that are involved in teaching or education, I mean, it requires a lot of one-on-one -on -one or small group interactions. And people like us in Major League Baseball that have a national reach, we look at that as very difficult to get some scale at the local level. And so for groups that have ideas about how to do that and how to connect with people in the communities, low-income communities, you know, all, all various different backgrounds and communities, reaching those communities in a way that's effective for those particular communities, I think is something that's really important. Deborah? I have a great way for you to get more coaches. And let's attract more women to be coaches and coaches of not only girl sports, but of boy sports. Um, the Project Play report talked about how when uh, moms are involved in sports, their kids and daughters are twice as likely to be involved. It uh, used to be that a uh, coach went under the sign of an M. You know, dads were the volunteer coaches. They were the ones that worked outside the home and that they wanted to spend time with their kids. But today, the Ws work outside the home and we want to spend more time with our kids and our friends' kids. We're very coachable. You give us a training program and we will follow that training program. You know us, whenever we play a sport. We've got to have the right clothing. We've got to take 10 <laughs> lessons. We, it's just kind of how we're socialized. So put us in front of a training program. And as Janet said, please be very mindful of what community you're going to be a coach in and how to relate to that female and male because each community is different. And we have to be, it's not a cookie cutter uh, condition. And so we have to be uh, really sensitive to that. Is there any one more answer to that question, Sam or Anthony? Either one? Sam? Well, I, I think, uh, that, as was said, all of the stakeholders here, everybody that's involved in Project Play, uh, the United States Olympic Committee being able to have the American Development uh, Program, that's going to help us all immensely in terms of getting a whole lot more of us on the same page in terms of what parents are hearing 
uh, as their kids are involved in youth sports uh, in terms of long-term uh, athlete development as one example. So having everybody here, th this synergy here is very exciting to me uh, that we have this opportunity to uh, begin to push out some common messages and uh, do that through our coaching education, uh, expand uh, what we're doing in our parent education, which is a huge piece of my mind uh, to help actually get to a tipping point is the parent education piece. <laughs> Terrific. Well, we're going to start with the questions, and, um, and if anybody has a question, if they could just line up at the end of the room where the microphone is, right in the middle here, and we'll take the questions. And one of the things that Project Play, uh, kids that were asked, what should we, what do we want from coaches? And a lot of it had not much to do with the skill training as it did with the respect and somebody that motivates me and somebody that makes it a safe environment, somebody that makes it fun. And I still want to underscore, if you have the skill piece and you have the coaches that have the skill piece, then that all will take care of itself. First question. Um, Ann Davis from the United States Tennis Association. Not as much a question, comment. You, you talked about parent education. And I think as we develop coaching education that really gets to the developmental side where it's about developing the child as opposed to the winning, we need to put in there how to educate the parent because many times that coach is the one who has to educate them that here's what we're doing. It's not about the W's. It's not about the run scored. It's about how your child develops. So I think that's a key, key part of it. Anybody want to comment on that or? Well, I think we kind of, and I think we kind of said that that it is the holistic approach, that it is it is teaching the physical literacy, but it's also teaching the sportsmanship. It's also teaching the nutrition. It's also uh, having fun and all those definitions of fun. Couldn't agree more, and I think we we all agree with you. Yes. Hi, uh, Rick Eckstein, Villanova University. Deborah, thank you for those words on female coaching, and I want to suggest maybe for a future roundtable in Aspen or Shanghai or wherever <laughs> that we try to figure out how to increase the number of women coaches, especially of women's and girls' teams. Uh, the data out there right now are shocking. Yeah. Uh, the decline in the number of women coaches of women's teams is, is repulsive, and we've got to come up with some strategy uh, to address that in the future. May I say one thing about uh, differences of, another difference of, of men and women is that I think men really feel I can coach, I'm an athlete, or I'm not an athlete and I'll go out and I'll coach. Women, whether it's coaching or, men, or running for government offices, we need to be asked. So it's very often it's not that we don't want to coach, but we really wait to be asked. So when you're thinking about where are the women, and I don't know any of them, Ask some. We like to be asked. Hi, I'm. Uh, my name is Nate Hilger. I'm a professor of economics at Brown. And um, one question and, and kind of a suggestion is that when there's a lot of research on teachers, which depends heavily on um, the existence of administrative data sets in, in states like Florida and Texas and New York and Illinois and North Carolina, which provide detailed data on uh, students in classrooms year after year, and this has, uh, you know, there's a trade-off between privacy and information, but school districts all across these large states have decided to share that detailed data with researchers, and that's led to findings of enormous value added by teachers, and we've learned that some teachers are massively better than others, and we've learned that some things predict those differences and some things don't. and um, there does not seem to be a similar data infrastructure for coaches, even though coaches are teaching similar skills. They're not teaching math and reading, but they're teaching all these um, important attitude uh, and you know discipline skills. And um, it's surprising to me that you know Little League and Pop Warner and AYSO don't have large administrative data sets that respect the privacy of players and coaches, but allow uh, people to track coaches over time and assess performance. Um, some of the claims made today seem like, you know, we're all sympathetic to them, but it's a little bit preaching to the choir about what coaches do and why some coaches are better than others. And if that data were made available um, in, a, in a way that respected privacy, I think you could preach to people who are not already part of the choir. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think it's. I think that's very clear that that would be helpful. Having more data and information would be great. We don't have a lot of data, which is a problem. I think that the challenge that you hear from people when you talk about that issue is that sports are supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be something that people want to do and enjoy. They, it doesn't want, they don't want it to be a job. They have a job already. So if you're going to be a coach, you want to do it because you're, in, you're having a good experience, you're enjoying it. And if all of a sudden there's A, B, C, D, E, F, G list of requirements that you have to complete as either a league operator, an official, or a coach, that makes it less appealing for people to want to participate. And so there's a push and pull there of um, willingness of people to implement some of these regulations, guidelines, standards. Oh, I, I don't mean to imply any regulations or, or additional requirements, just the you know, keeping track of what players are, what, what kids are playing with what coaches. It's well, just so, keeping but that's what I'm saying is so a lot of these leagues don't even have a database. They're very, very small local organizations that don't track things on a computer even. I mean, sure. so that's why it's... But a, but a lot of the big ones do have the databases yeah. and they're just yeah, not, yeah. they're not made available and I think... I'm yeah, I, 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 I agree with you on that point. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any question that finding ways to make data more widely accessible um, would be great. It's just a matter of uh, communicating that to people and getting that completed. Sure. So Thanks, you mean, in a way that when teachers, after a class, the uh, students evaluate the teacher, you know, it maybe can be, you know, on a different, I don't know what the measures are, but uh, that, are you saying that maybe the players could evaluate the coach and say, you know, they'd come back because they like the coach or no, what, you, what they want. You, you can more. do things like you can keep track of what kids had Mrs. Smith for an English teacher in ninth grade mm -hmm. and what kids had Mr. Johnson as an English teacher in ninth grade. And you find out that the kids who got randomly assigned to Mrs. Smith have uh, less unemployment, less teen pregnancy, higher earnings later in life. And that, I think, contributes to the professionalization of, you know, and how teachers are perceived. And because the data on coaches is not made available, we're all making all these claims about how great it is and we all kind of know we think introspectively that it's true, but the data doesn't al that's made available doesn't allow us to prove it to people with money who are a little skeptical. Thank you, Nate. Hi, uh, Matt Bowers from the University of Texas. I'm going to go in a slightly different direction and kind of throw something out there for you. We talked um, almost exclusively about adults in this um, and adults as coaches. You look at the success of a lot of alternative sports, look at skateboarding, um, you know, those are driven primarily by peer coaching models. And so how do we integrate the concept of peer coaching into our systems that structurally require, almost require us to have adults involved? Are there creative ways we can think of that that bring that dynamic into, into the equation? Well, one of the things that, that we've uh, done is had, um, at Coaching Corps, has had high school students coach, um, and we get around the whole legality thing of it because they're, they're placed with an old, a, a, a college or university student over 18. So then you almost have a three-generation strategy. You have the kids seeing the high school kid coach who's being mentored by the college university kid who is uh, ultimately sometimes paired up with a parent and we're beginning to see each of those generations becoming the next so yeah. I, I agree that there's a lot of potential for that yeah and, and we talk about the positivity that adults ha can have but also a lot of times kids don't want to be around adults if they can avoid it particularly into the teen years so yeah. what you know are there things that from a you know from an an organizational standpoint we can do to support that and that's more of a rhetorical question mm -hmm. but it's something that I think is important because we keep talking about fun adults aren't that much fun a lot of the times I mean they can be right but but they aren't necessarily and so. that could be part of a big idea of how do you really get those peers involved early yeah in in some way that's structured to begin with and then leave it to be unstructured maybe yeah and Terry we just uh, in Soccer circles, we have a, a program called the Chris Nadelkovich Scholarship Fund, and it's for it's based on youth coaching youth, and so it's money to send people between the ages of 17 and 23 into our existing coaching education programs that we have. Uh, so they are thinking about how do we find the funds and help students uh, who probably don't have a lot of funds to be able to go through some of the coaching courses. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Hi, I'm Kristen Diefenbach, West Virginia University. And uh, to speak to the earlier point, there are some NGBs that are currently looking at tracking coaches and seeing how those kids do, how many of them stay in sport and stuff like that. But that's very preliminary. I know that's going on. But another issue I wanted to sort of raise and get your thoughts on is the idea of a lot of times our coaching education is reactive, not proactive. And a lot of the coaching education that small groups in particular can do is reactive to something that's been told to them they have to do. And how do we help flip the model a little bit so that the organizations have people who are in charge of coaching education. That's their job. That's what they're designed to do. It's not an add-on job for something else they do. And that coaching education then is a well thought out forward program as opposed to, oh, we got to catch up with this and oh, we got to mandate that. And there's some stuff that's been done within the International Council of Coaching Excellence, which is the group over in Europe that is an international governing body to try to put forth some frameworks so that within an organization, when you think about your coaching education division, it's not an extra job of somebody else who's doing marketing and five other things, yeah. but it's coaching education for the purpose of educating, not driving revenue from coaching ed or anything else, but truly educating. And again, how do we switch that in the US system a little bit to make that a job that is worth being prepared and trained for and a job that's solely dedicated to um, doing that kind of work? Love your thoughts. Christy, I'll just comment on that too. You know, there's a lot of comments that teaching and coaching, it's, it's really a teacher as a coach, a coach as a teacher. But we really, um, you know, there's very few programs in college that have coaching as a curriculum. Um, and very few people that really learn coaching through somebody that's totally dedicated only through coaching. So I think all those models are good. And they're a lot easier in the countries where there's a very centralized governing structure of teaching coaches or even having a governing structure for youth sports. So those are good comments. Yes. Hi, Terry, oh, could I jump ahead, in Sanya. on that one? Uh, in, again, in, in soccer circles, we, uh, we have 55 state associations. We have 55 because we take California, Texas, Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania, chop them into two. Uh, of those 55, we have 55 state offices. Uh, of those 55, 50 of them are full-time uh, coaching directors of coaching. That's their full-time job is coaching education for their state soccer association. And um, then the others are part-time, and that's just uh, because their soccer population is so small, they can't generate the funds for it to be a full-time job, although they end up working full-time at it. So player development and coaching education, that's their full-time gig. My name is Paul Cole from the Sports Director at Asphalt Green in Manhattan. I feel like we get a little too caught up in the X's and O's of coach education. I, I do applaud what US soccer is trying to do and getting all of the coaches minimum F licenses, but I think we shouldn't forget about people management. Um, and I have the luxury of working with all paid coaches, but I'm sure a lot of people work with volunteer coaches and we don't ha they don't have the time to come in and take paid trainings. And I think we need to teach them the correct ways to communicate with kids, how their body language is very important, uh, because the reality is that some of my most technically gifted coaches are not very good people managers and vice versa. And the good people managers have the better results with the kids. Um, so I, I like the concept of whistle sports, that this is a viral thing that kids are uploading clips to um, and being inspired by those clips. And I, I don't think anything exists, but I wonder if there is some sort of online platform or social media app that could be created that is providing coaching tools to volunteer and paid coaches on people management. It's hard to do it sports specific technically, but you can teach a coach how to talk to a child or react to a loss or what putting their hands on their heads does to a child across all sports. And I think if we could come up with a way to get that viral and figure out people management skills across all areas, I think it would be really important. I'd be interested to hear any thoughts. I think that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. That's what's going to make it fun for the kids and want them to stay involved and, and more fun for the coach. Um, I did not pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs>
but working with sports medicine professionals, uh, we have created an app uh, that shows uh, parents and coaches and kids the strength conditioning exercises they should do that will reduce injuries by 50%, ACL injuries, which happen to girls five times more than boys, um, by 70%. Um, we've had the prototype out there. Uh, we've talked to literally hundreds of coaches, and we've learned a couple things about what coaches tell us. Number one, um, they feel like they are on the other side of the digital divide. They blow the whistle to start practice. The cell phone goes into the backpack. They blow the whistle, practice is over, it comes right back out. They feel like the other uh, on the other side of that. We're giving coaches the ability to interact with their kids, with their teams, in a virtual basis to say, congratulations on doing those exercises. Here's a reward from you. So rewards come from the coaches themselves. Uh, the other thing that we've learned from coaches um, is that how important they are to the process. When coaches buy into what we're doing and talk to the kids about doing it and engage parents and kids, we see tremendous results. We see the kids doing it and the activities happening um, all the time. Um, and anecdotal evidence that we have at this point coming from coaches who have used the app for a sports season, basically the fall season. In tournament time, they're saying, I have more girls, mostly girls are picking this up now. I have more girls playing at the end of the season, playing three games in a two-day tournament, and I'm not seeing the kind of injuries that I used to see. They're in shape at the end of the season. So, you know, thanks for the question. We're doing it, and it's working. We're actually working with Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association. 100,000 kids will be using the app this springtime. Um, great organization up there. I met with their board of directors earlier this week. So terrific uh, organization they're doing. They're on the leading edge of a lot of technology kind of things, and this is one of them. So thank you. Hi, uh, Hudson Taylor with Athlete Ally, and I don't, I'm not sure how to formulate this question exactly, but I started wrestling when I was six years old, and um, I think that there's this sort of tug of war between uh, having fun and creating, you know, that uh, that free play environment and, and possibility, but also on the flip side, being hyper competitive and winning, right? So as a wrestler, what was fun was winning, and right, that, that's why I stayed in my sport because I was good at it. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think coaches are not incentivized to be those positive mentors and life coaches because ultimately what decides whether or not they continue coaching or not is the, uh, you know, the record of the team at the end of the year. How many trophies goes in the high school or middle, uh, middle school hallway, right? So I guess my question is how do we change the narrative to focus less on athletic success and more on um, raising and coaching successful human beings? Um, yeah. Anthony, that would be great for you to answer <laughs> as a wrestler. <laughs> we know each other pretty well. Our team's competed in college. So. Uh, but I think for me, you know, I was blessed with a great coach who kind of, he had a good balance of both. But uh, number one, he put the athlete first as a person just motivating them. And uh, just, I carry something special with me. Um, wrote this little note to myself when I was 14. I got into wrestling at 14, and I was last place in, in my city that year. I lost a ton, but uh, I didn't know how to handle that. You know, I wanted to quit. I was very discouraged. But I had a great coach who, who had those skills, those motivational skills, to handle those losses, to teach me how to handle them. And to, uh, he had the ability just to keep me interested in the sport, just to have fun whether I was winning or losing. And I think that's key first. I mean, I went on to do pretty well in my college career <laughs> later on. But at that moment, it was all about having fun. That's what kept me there. Not, the winning comes, but number one, it has to be having fun. And so that's, that's the most important thing is being able to have those skills to, to teach the kids and keep them motivated and show them it's not just uh, fun when you're, when you're winning. You know, it's and fun when you're losing. What's too. your note? Well, my note, it says state champ. That was my first goal. So uh, 26 now, I wrote it when I was 14. But... You know, I think that's what we need. We need more coaches like this, like the guy who made me write this, because that's when I what's going to take them later on in life. You know, take them off the field, out of the arena. It's those skills that they learn and, and those, that, that motivation that they got way back when from, from those coaches. I think that those are terrific points. And, you know, I, I've lived a life of coaching, and I think that if our society only hires coaches in middle school and high school based on winning and losing, um, we're going to be in trouble. I mean, we see that in college and in the pros. They're paid for different reasons. But what endures really with a lot of things is exactly that positive model, the academic success of the athletes in college. Most of them will never compete in the pros or on the national teams or in the Olympics. 
but a lot of other things are going to happen in learning skills, feeling worthy, learning how to socialize. And I think good coaches are going to really make the kids understand that. And certainly Todd, I heard one other thing that you said, and that, you, yes, you said about winning, and that was great. But you also said that you were good. And, I, and that says that you were competent and that you had confidence. And I wonder if that was also what made it fun for you. Yeah, the trophy, but you're the one, you said I was good. And that's, that's a hell of a statement. Oops, that, that's a great statement. <laughs> today. Sorry, that's, that says a lot. And focusing things on winning only and not through a youth development frame really aces out most of the kids that, that are the kids who Project Play is trying to focus on to get them in the game. So we, I think we need much more training. There's a lot of us in the, this room, PCA up to us, lots of organizations that do train coaches from a youth development frame. And I think we need more of that in order to get the kids that Project Play is focused on in the game. That's the way we'll get them and then we'll keep them. It's not about winning. Good. Next. Hi, I'm Nancy Tsai with the American Council on Exercise. I'm also a board certified sports medicine physician, and I'm also a coach for um, a couple of elite athletes for our US Paralympic team. So um, I have a little bit of experience. I want to break down the final barrier, I think, to this project play. I am a kid until the day I die. I have parents. Every single one of us are kids until the day we die. I want you to challenge your thought that you're an adult and you're no longer a kid. Continue to be coachable. You are going to learn how to coach by being coached. And I want to challenge everybody to do that. Go out and learn a sport that you haven't done. And when you do it, go back and take those skills and bring it back to the kids. Watch the kids as they coach each other. I think these are all really important skills. I'm not going to stop, and I want to challenge everybody to do that. Coaching is about heart and soul. What I bring to my athletes is heart and soul. I genuinely care. Not just about how well they did that day, but about them as a person. And I think that makes a difference. It's about being inclusive. It's about caring about their nutrition. It's about caring about their mental state. It's about caring about their physical abilities. Every single one of my athletes has a giant training log, and it includes all of those things. I think until we start practicing those things, we're not going to know what it's like to be a coach. But those are fundamental skills. Those are things that are very easy that we can do when we learn it from a new perspective, doing something new again, we can then translate it to everybody around us. Very good. Very well said. All right. Hi, I'm Laura Dixon with Spurs Sports and Entertainment, the parent company of the San Antonio Spurs, Silver Stars, Rampage, Toros, and more to come. Um, but I think what you're talking about is, is leading by example, and our head coach certainly leads by example. Um, his infinite wisdom 25 years ago created the Spurs Youth Basketball League. Coaches training is required. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, we're always looking at. And, you know, I think there are some model programs like Up To Us and PCA that do things that help us continually evaluate what we're doing. And my, my question around that is, you know, are we asking coaches what they want? Like we ask kids, mm -hmm. because as the high profile and professional sports organizations or entities, governing bodies, whatever, we have probably the things in our toolbox that they want. Are we willing to share? Are we willing to be resourceful enough to give that to them? And who are the funders in the room that could make that happen if it's not those organizations or governing bodies? Um, the other thing is, um, you know, whenever you talk about coaching data and gathering that, um, I think there are a lot of organizations who might be willing to share that, um, but having a longitudinal study done on that is expensive. And if there's a university in the room who wants to do that, we are willing to offer a great partnership. Um, I think there are probably many other organizations in the room that would do the same thing. And there may be partners um, in the funding space that would do that too. And maybe this um, group could help find some of those. I just, Chris, I, 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 you brought up because in being involved in the NBA, and you know we think about this a lot at Major League Baseball. The big four or five or how many, you know, the big sports leagues, we have a lot of assets to offer in that we have a high profile, a lot of people are interested in our coaches, our players, et cetera. The problem that we have is we don't have, we're professional by definition. So we don't have a lot of connectivity to the amateur landscape. Yeah, there's some programs where you may set something up 
and we, we uh, have our own programs as well, but we don't have a huge network of uh, organizations that we're connected to in the youth space. And so I guess I would throw that out to the people here is, you know, we're, I think sometimes people are scared to approach the, the big sports leagues because we're so big and we have, you know, a lot of cachet or whatever you want to call it or brand recognition. But we're very open to hearing from people with ideas that have reach into these communities. And we want to work with you guys and we want to be involved in these communities. And I think we, a lot of our coaches and players are more than happy to go out and, and have events with, with people in the community to do videos and online programs and things like that that, um, you know, expose the things that we're doing to people out in the community and make it more attractive to be, to be a coach and to be a good coach. Last question. <laughs> two more? There's two more. Um, All right. Nathan Plan with Nike. I actually deliberately got up just before Paul to, to <laughs> steal his question from him. We've got five minutes. So five that, minutes, yeah. okay. Um, I'll make it a really long question then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I want to shake it up a little bit. Uh, I think, um, contrary to, to what um, many people would think, we do a really great job of training some coaches. A really great job. Um, but this panel is about training all coaches, as Janet said. Um, and I think the two things don't often work hand in hand. And one of the reasons we don't do a great job of training all coaches is we get obsessed by coach education, great coaching, coaching excellence. And I would suggest that the first thing we need to do is ban those phrases. Because the reason we want to train all coaches isn't, yes, it's, it's, it, we all know what great coaching can do. We should, we should wrap in nutrition. We should wrap, wrap in character development, um, physical literacy. All these things that great coaching can do. We're not talking about great coaching. What we're talking about is the fact that kids don't play unless there's adult supervision. Free play doesn't exist. So kids don't get together and play on their own. There always has to be an adult. Whoa. Um, <laughs> they agree. They, they agree. There always has to be an adult in the room or, or on the field. So the title of the panel should almost be not train all coaches, but prepare all adults or high school kids or whoever they may be to, to monitor and supervise the play of kids and make sure that by the end of the hour or 90 minutes, they're all still in one piece and they all have a smile on their face. And that's it. That's the bottom line. That's what we want of the majority of youth sports coaches. Now there are, on top of that, there are coaches in... Um, the youth soccer associations, for example. So I'm one of those. I'm, I'm going through your program. I am, I am not your typical example. I'm not the kind of coach we're talking about. We're talking about the people, the parents who have absolutely no idea what they're supposed to be doing. So what I would suggest is, what can we, can we agree on? What's the bare minimum that we can expect of them and ask of them? Because the bare minimum that we agree on is still going to be a lot more than they've got at the moment even though it's going to be a lot less than the kind of things that they could be doing. Because the reality is they're not. And apologies to everyone who's dedicated their careers to, <laughs> to coach education. But, but that's not what we're solving for. We're solving for parents and other volunteers who are the kitchen table coaches sitting at the kitchen table the night before. They have to get onto a field with between 10 and 15, 6 to 12-year-olds, and they just don't know what to do. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Paul, that's, notions of great that's a great idea. It'd be great if you could summarize that and say, how do you do that? And how do you get that across to all the different levels of recreational sport or youth sport? I have and, to do that too. I thought well, that was I'll pretty... follow up. I know that's a great <laughs> big idea, but that. I'll follow up with you. I'll give you a card and I'll follow up with you on that. There are okay. many of us that do that in this room, and it's absolutely true. I, it's, it's, you know, how do you get the kids to respect each other, have fun, and, um, and, and, and do their best and believe in themselves? And, 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 uh, thanks. <laughs> I'm Paul Kakamo, I'm founder of uh, Up To Us and Coach Across America. We, this is, co coaching is the greatest solution to so many challenges facing kids in this country, whether it's when we know this, the dropout rates, health, violence, because a coach is able to have that kind of influence and create an environment where we know kids can attach, have positive peer attachment where kids can learn the joy of, of, of progressing versus necessarily being a master at something, where kids learn leadership. And it's all about the training and the coaching. And as has been said all over, and I know I'm the last thing, it's youth development. And we have 30 years of understanding of youth development, but we haven't yet applied it to sports-based youth development and what it means to train coaches using the unique atmosphere of sports. There's nothing like it for kids to be a part of in learning as, as, as any kind of team. It doesn't matter the sport. It takes them out of the traditional school place, out of the family place. And the coach is the leader. We know 
And we're doing it, I, I know a lot of us are doing it like Janet, we're doing sports-based youth development training. We have 32 hours of certification at up to us for our coaches. What will it take for, for I, soccer has been largely a lar largest part of my life in terms of a sport, but for the F license to include f four basic hours of youth development for every sort of like license in a, in a sport for a coach to say, let's start with four hours at a project play. Let's make the recommendation, these four pillars of understanding what it means to have 32 to 15 kids look at you like you're God, and this is what you're going to do about it, is how do you build those positive relationships? 10 tips for that. 10 tips for enjoying every single kid is participating. 10 tips for creating joy, team culture, team values that create resiliency so kids know they're part of the team and don't have to be part of a gang. These are things we know how to do. Let's create the minimum hours and let's do it. Very good. <laughs> just, just to summarize, there's, there's a lot of great ideas and I think getting more women involved to be coaches is one. Uh, merging a way that the professional sports can now find the volunteer base to get their ideas across. And certainly, I think coaches as, as mentors, and I'll leave you with one thought because those ideas are written down and we could see them later, is that all young kids or older kids could care less how much you know unless they know how much you care. And the one thing I want to underscore, it's not only unstructured play, but it's mastery. Once you start becoming good at something, you're going to keep doing it. It's like uh, anyone that gets good at anything needs to learn how to do the skill. So it's a combo of both. And I think there's a lot of great ideas here. I wanted to really uh, thank the panel. And uh, if there's any other questions, you can talk to the individual panel members. Lots of great ideas, and we certainly are going to act on those as best as we can. So thank you. Real quickly here, we have a couple of uh, plays that are going to be announced um, as uh, uh, here in a minute. So we were going to do one earlier, but we didn't get our chance to do so. So could the uh, uh, School and Arts uh, Foundation from New York come up? Is Shannon here? Okay, good. So Shannon, why don't you go first, and uh, Chris, you can, you can follow on. Why don't you try this one here? Thank you. Um, it's a little repetitive now that we've just talked about all that because it's about <laughs> training coaches. So I won't, I won't go over all the details we just talked about. But the idea is that we're going to develop or we're in the process of developing a continuing education program for our over 100 coaches that run our after-school sports programs. And the idea is to tie in all these different things we're talking about, but the key aspects are how to work with kids how to work with people, um, and to sprinkle in some of that cool stuff like nutrition and sportsmanship and leadership. Um, we also have a girls' gym program where we uh, do Saturdays and we teach them different types of sports and have you know, uh, body image discussions and really facilitate those type, of, those type of discussions with these young girls. We hope to bring that more into after-school programs and not just on Saturdays, um, and to get more women into, into our programs teaching the, the girls, but in the meantime, also coaching our men on how to deal with girls because, like we know, it's difficult to get more women in here so we want to teach the men how to deal with the girls so we're not losing out in the meantime so that's what we're doing at sports and arts and schools in new york city great chris you want to tell you tell us what yeah, major, so, league baseball um, major league baseball we recently announced a partnership with the positive coaching alliance um, and i know some of the organizations here i'm sure have relationships with with pca or some of the other <laughs> groups that are out there i think the thing that's unique about our partnership is that we are funding the partnership at the professional level to be implemented at the amateur level. And so this gets back to the question around data collection and about learning. We're going to be able to learn a lot about what's effective, which programs are most responsive to these types of educational initiatives so that we at the professional level have that national, that, that scaled understanding of, OK, we implemented this program in these various domestic programs. We're doing it in some international programs as well, so we can understand which uh, foreign countries might be more receptive to the programs versus others. And so to the idea about test and learn and about gathering information and about gathering data, we're, we're going to be doing that this year in terms of sponsoring uh, coaches, over 2,000 coaches that are going to be taking PCA programming and learning more about what's successful and, and what works. So we're excited about it.